even though so my research subjects I've been looking at the Bali art institutions. Uh, for this particular research seminar series, I wanted to have a more methodological conversation. So today I will mostly be talking about some methodological concerns and queries that I have when it comes to anthropology. Um, so as I say, um, I'm also reading out of a script on the QR code funny saw for people who would, you know, want to just follow through the um, oral presentation. Um, so there are printed Kazasma QR code print So uh, just for accessibility, you know, if you want to uh, just follow through as I speak through the script. Um, any, uh, as I say, I, I didn't really present, uh, prepare a PowerPoint presentation, a little bit burnt out from preparing a lot of slides, uh, but also trying to experiment with a new maybe form of presenting and engaging in conversations. And so I will be reading out a script. Um, I don't think the script will exceed more than 20 to 25 minutes. Um, so the allotted 40 minutes would say 20 minutes, I can push it to our Q&A and we can have a more engaged and interactive session. Um, any, um, so the script that I am presenting today is uh, my first draft at trying to write about methods uh, through my experience of doing field work in Nepal. Um, I've been reaching out to a couple of other peers who are doing anthropology in wanting to co-author methods paper. So as a co-paper is also sort of a, a start to probably trying to write a paper on it. Um, this has a script. And um, so on the last month, I would also like to open the floor for a, a thought slash writing experiment. So all of you maybe after I'm done with my script, we can all take five to 10 minutes to do some kind of writing exercise. So, which is not necessarily a present like speaker format, but I think that would be more like fruitful and productive maybe, right? Okay. Um, any script say English ma so, um, school ma say Nepali sorry, English ma'am li ali body maya gara my English is slightly better. So Nepali is always struggle or so. so uh, that's it. Any, um, yeah, if you have any uh, feedback, thoughts, opinions on what I share today, I, I definitely would love to talk to all of you one on one about your research as well and how we can, you know, sort of kickstart a conversation about methods in, in more sincere ways, right? Um, okay, so to Bonero, I'll start my script. Um, no say everyone. Thank you for coming to this presentation. It's been a while since I've presented at Market So Delhi. I think the last time I presented was 2017. Uh, thank you to Pratish Ji and the team at Martin So Delhi for helping put together this session. Um, currently, I'm pursuing a doctorate in anthropology and technically I'm somewhere towards the end of my field work. One of the questions I get asked the most is when will I be done with my PhD? Um, so to respond to that question, I decided to give a talk at Martin Society. That's my way of responding. Um, but to be very serious, um, I am often not sure how to respond to this question because when I am asked that question, what I am hearing is, when will you be done with your research? Uh, to be very honest with you all, I don't think I'll ever be done with my research. Um, the goal for today's presentation is therefore to engage in a thought experiment or critical reflection on some of the methodological and thereby theoretical underpinnings of the discipline of anthropology, as I've come to know quite intimately in the past few years. So instead of talking to you all about the content of my doctoral research, which I do hope to share with you all one day, today I want to reflect on what it has meant to receive training both in Nepal and the US to become an anthropologist. How many of you here today are here because you are receiving some kind of formal educational training in anthropology? So to show of hands, how many of you here are actually studying anthropology? One, two, three, four. Okay. 
Um, how many of you are here because you are curious to know what anthropology is? <laughs> um, yeah, my title was uh, deliberately obscure because um, you know why. And how many of you are here because you know me but not what I do? <laughs> okay, that's a good balance of people I feel. Um, okay, every time someone used to ask me why I wanted to become an anthropologist, I used to reply with, oh, I love listening to people's experiences. What I wasn't aware then, and sometimes still forget, is that listening is a very gendered act in our society. And in being gendered, it is also laced with class and caste context. As a young 20-something, educated in Kathmandu's private school and colleges, brought up in a nuclear middle class, ethnically confused and religiously all over the place family, I barely knew these contexts that were so integrally part of my emergent subjectivity. To me, listening was not necessarily a difficult act. It was always encouraged and rewarded. It came easily to me, almost too easily. What I truly struggled with was not listening, but asking questions. So when my doctoral advisor during a review meeting told me, Dipti, anthropology is not about doing ethnography. Anthropology is about asking anthropological questions. It took me a while to register this. You might be thinking, but what are anthropological questions? Well, we are all in the same boat, trying to figure out what are these anthropological questions? And who can ask these questions? Where, when, to whom, and how? What perhaps can help conceptualize what anthropological questions is, is the history of the discipline itself. I'm sure those of you here who are familiar with the discipline Know that the emergence of anthropology is intimately tied to the empire and its projects of colonialism. Anthropology is birthed out of a series of epistemic violence. It was a tool to understand the quote unquote cultural other and not just understand, but somehow represent them and their ways of culture of being and becoming through writings. It was a scholastic experiment that Western scholars embarked in at the expense of those being studied and engaged in discourses that will shed light on how we can understand differing cultural conditions of being humans. Thus came voluminous ethnographic monographs. I remember having to read Clifford Gears's thick description on Balinese cockfight, even before I joined the anthropology program at DU. How many of you are familiar with Clifford Gears and his writing? Great. Um, it was a required reading for my English course in the intermediate or more popularly known plus two level. And I remember reading it without an ounce of critical thinking. I read it for literary devices and voices. Not once did I question who Geertz was, why he was in Bali with his wife, and why he was so fascinated with Balinese cockfight. Later, I would go on to religiously memorize definitions of culture by people like Talcott Parsons, Avon Pritchard, and Clyde Cluckhorn, to name a few dead famous anthropologists. And I do not remember asking why I was reading them. And I think this is where my anthropological questions begin from. Why do I care for anthropology so much? I was brainstorming with a peer about how to do this presentation today. I always do that before any presentation, just to calm the nerves. And I told her, look, I do not feel any sort of loyalty to the discipline. And here I was trying to write a love letter to anthropology, feel notes from home. And this might all be surprising to you all too. After all, I'm a doctoral candidate in a department of anthropology, and I'm saying I do not feel any loyalty to this discipline. Then why am I trying to become an anthropologist? The simple answer is I'm not. And the more complex response is that when I started, I honestly did not know how deeply problematic the history of this discipline was, even when I was presented with the facts in the classrooms, and I am, you know, bachelor's level, master's level, diploma courses, and all of that. How many of you though, have been taught about cultural relativism? How many of you have heard that term? Right. It's a famous anthropological concept proposed by Franz Boas, an American anthropologist and we had to learn about Boas as being the father of anthropology. And they always forgot to mention he was the father of American anthropology, not like anthropology at large. <laughs> um, so in any case, the classic definition of cultural relativism 
is to understand different cultural practices and groups in their own context without ascribing any hierarchical notion of one cultural belief being better or superior to others. And it was always couched in the broader debate between the universal and the particular that always ails our discipline. But let's try to think why we need to learn this definition. To me, this is a very didactic definition that's telling you to not judge the cultural practices of others. Who do you think are being taught to not judge cultural practices of others? <clears throat> Students of Goa. So when this methodological framework is imported to classrooms here, the historical and didactic nature of this concept is obscure. So as someone who belongs to a culture or place that has been a subject of continuous study, what does it mean for me to adopt cultural relativism? The absurdity of all of this creates a cognitive dissonance in my anthropological practice. Most of the times it is difficult for me to adopt a culturally relativistic approach to the patriarchal, Brahmanical, and many other problematic structures and systems in place that is part of quote unquote my culture. I do not have the privilege of being an outsider and yet I'm never fully an insider. Perpetually stuck in between. Funnily, a term used by the British anthropologist Victor Turner to describe liminality in all of these Zambian rituals. Um, I'm confronted with a methodological paradox that very often is not discussed in classrooms. Another key methodological tool that we are taught as anthropologists is participant observation. This method is all about immersing yourself in the field, being there, and building relationships. Building relationships gives you access to the community, members of the community, and hopefully the knowledge that they hold about the community. How many of you have met anthropologists in Nepal who've spent months and years in a community, learned their languages, and participated in and observed their everyday life and conflicts and so on? This is what we do. I have for the past two years been involved in understanding how the Nepali art world operates. And in doing so, I have participated in and observed numerous interactions, programs, and events. Often people I interview ask me whether I do draw or paint. Unfortunately, that is a language that I have not yet learned. But the point I'm trying to get at is that the method of participant observation is a method that is trying to guarantee a safe entry and exit for a researcher into and from a community. What about those who do not or cannot exit the community? This is a question to researchers here who are working with the communities that they either belong to or have affinities with. Historically, however, it hasn't taken too long for an outsider to be considered an insider in Nepal. We are all, after all, friendly people, hospitable and easygoing. Yes, we are struggling, perpetually in precarity. Our government's volatile and at best defunct. Our economy failing and failing. The social fabric of our society fraught with ecological and political calamities. And yet we are friendly people, perfect for the method of participant observation. I've been fortunate enough to have encountered few interlocutors during my field work who have exercised their right to ethnographic refusal. How many of you here have heard the term ethnographic refusal? Ethnographic. Wow. Ethnographic refusal. Anthropologists in the house. <laughs> okay. Perhaps it is important to predicate the discussion on ethnographic refusal with an inquiry into what exactly is ethnography. I remember one of my friends recently asking me, looking quite bewildered, what is the difference between ethnography and anthropology? If this were a master's level exam for, let's say, introduction to anthropological thinking, and I've taken that exam, you would reflexively start writing this. It's ideologically, anthropos means humans, and logos means the study of. Similarly, ethno means people, and graphy refers to write or to record. I'm really not sure why we're learning very specific Greek or Latin terms for these concepts, given we're never really taught those languages. But do they not sound like they mean almost the same thing? And fair enough, 
I tend to use anthropological and ethnographic interchangeably. But are those two concepts interchangeable? One is a discipline and the other a methodology. <clears throat> and I think the conflation between the two is not at all an innocent act. Ethnography as a method centers humans as the subject of a writing. And ethnographic refusal is when the subjects refuse to speak or be represented or be recorded or be written into a record. I do not think we've been trained enough to reckon with ethnographic refusals, primarily because we've been trained um, in all kinds of methodological tools in our abilities to extract and extrapolate. None of the methods tell you how to deal with refusals. They ask you to build rapport and relationships, participate and observe. And to add to this another layer, what happens when you as a researcher engage in acts of refusal? Can you even dare to do so? When the pandemic hit, I was about to start my field work, which was brought to a halt because of the lockdowns and the bleak scenario of social isolation and death and loss. At the height of the pandemic, we were simultaneously talking about both burning anthropology and doing digital ethnography, a virtually mediated ethnographic encounter. The cognitive dissonance persists. I often try to remember the early days of 2021, which is quite a distant memory, utterly confused and anxious, and wonder what if I had done what many others were doing, and wonder why I refused. There is a pressure in anthropology for humans to speak and represent themselves, even and especially when they are experiencing precarity. Not just those who are being studied, but also those who are conducting the study, especially if you are from the community that you are studying. In a way, to refuse is liberating. To refuse is to occupy a space of negation. To refuse is to create discomfort. And this is where my anthropological questions stem from. Various scales of discomfort, some quite embodied in having to ask questions, because as you remember, never got rewarded for asking questions. So when I was given the opportunity to start asking questions, I did not know where to begin from. I often hear from peers and students, what topic should I select? Many of you who are here pursuing a graduate degree in social sciences probably can relate. Infinite topics under the sun to pick from. And especially when you do not know the question you're trying to ask. But luckily for me, I did know what questions I did not want to ask. Having worked in the field of social sciences and research in Nepal for a few years before joining the PhD program, I had made few mental notes about questions that I was not interested in asking. My master's thesis was on the personal narratives of Thakali women, for people who don't know, I am Thakali. And that experience taught me that I was not interested in asking questions that made members of my community the subjects of my study. I worked for a few years in Mugu with a theater artist who was interested in building an art center. And that experience taught me that I was not interested in asking questions that made members of the communities in Mugu or the art center the subject of my study. For a while, I was involved in few research projects around conflict as well as disaster. And, for those, and those experiences taught me that I was not interested in asking questions that made people experiencing precarity the subjects of my study. This is not to suggest that those topics should never be subjects of any anthropological inquiries. What I'm trying to articulate here is a series of refusals as an academic that laid me to the questions that I'm asking today. And maybe this is a section that requires further discussion during the Q&A and we can talk about it, all of that. When we were taught to write research proposals, we are always taught to write research questions and statement of problem. I could never fully grasp what the statement of problem really meant. I understand that a researcher is stating a problem and in that problem situating their research questions. It seems quite simple, formulaic, but the mold has never been broken for a research proposal, not in the US, not in Nepal. There's something to be said about this. What is never asked is whether you are the right person to be asking the question and stating the problem. What is never asked is whether there are uneven power relations playing out in the field such that only specific people are asking questions and specific people are having to respond. 
With all these apprehensions and reservations in mind, it is funny to me and probably to all of you that I'm nearing the end of my field work. My peers as well as my advisor believe that I've stayed in the field for far too long. I agree, it's time to go back. Uh, every researcher experiences this denial, but this is particularly potent for researchers like me who are doing anthropological work in a place they also call home. Home that was always fraught with disciplining of gendered bodies so that doing fieldwork meant navigating tenuous kinships, both filial and fictive, that are immediately offered to you in the field. Home where you cannot just build rapport and press pause or play in building relationships with interlocutors. Home is where you make friends. Home that is always under the radar of ethnographic gaze and strategic essentialism, creating a dialectic wherein authenticity is always a subject of inquiry. My friend made a note that that last sentence is really confusing, so we can talk about that also later. Uh, this exercise in reflexivity and critical appraisal of positionality is not novel. Scholars both from the global north and global south have engaged in this methodological quandary. Scholars from fields like indigenous studies, black studies, and queer studies have consistently pushed the limits of the discipline. This exercise is mostly an attempt to, my, to find my voice in the space where writing females from home has not always been an easy task. Framing anthropological questions have not always been a scholarly pursuit. When I was writing my research grant proposals, I was always recommended, you must convey a sense of urgency to the reviewer and I failed miserably every time. To be honest, nothing about my research felt urgent. Not because they were not, but because the pace at which a field works is not singular. It is sedimented with both banal and urgent. The stakes are not singularly high or low. It undulates between the two. There is no closure to this exercise today. And so here I ask you all to engage in a thought writing experiment. I'm sure many of you present here have had experience of doing research in Nepal. And I want to ask you, if you were given the control to reimagine anthropology or social science research as field and with it, it is, with it its methodological contours, what would you do? Please take five to 10 minutes to think and write it down. And perhaps we can all share it with each other to start this conversation. Thank you. Um, so that's the script, and I think maybe we can take five to ten minutes for everyone to sort of calm down, <laughs> including myself. And if you are all willing to engage in this exercise of writing for a little bit, then I would very much appreciate it. And then maybe we can open for Q and A. Thanks. Yes. Yeah, so five to ten minutes, please. Uh, pen, paper, right. The, the theme is, I can repeat it again. If you were given the control to reimagine anthropology or social science research as a field, and with it, its methodological contours, what would you do? Please take five to 10 minutes to think and write it down, and then we can come and share. And then you can also ask me questions. Time is over, right? Mm. <laughs> I can start a timer. Zoom day no, this is in
that's me for you but if you want more time that's <laughs> that's great तो <laughs> 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 री इमेजिनेशन में तुम्हें रिसर्च को फील कसो देखिन्थ्य होग्रह मत अब आई थिंक वी आर अल्सो अलमोस्ट डन सो मे बी अब यू कैन ओपन द फ्लोर चाहिए Uh, to start from the premise that knowledge is holistic, I would like to see better co- collaboration across disciplines. This is, I guess, another way of saying that I would like to see researchers not to be confined to their disciplinary silos, but to reach out to others for exchanging ideas, particularly those with whom one has methodological or philosophical differences, mm-hmm. a rigorous and critical exchange of ideas, but with good faith to arrive at the truth, is probably the best way to arrive at the truth. Trust us, any to what extent do you think this is happening in Nepal and in in US universities? Unsa one by one karon? Ayo. Unsa. Um, thank you, Sashwati. Um, I can't answer the second question to what extent this is happening in the US or anywhere else, right? But it's really interesting. The some of the key words that I caught on was holistic, right, and and rigorous and good faith and truth, right, and and what I am trying to do or my. empirical experience while trying to do field work has been that there this is this is a myth right this is this idealized idea of how knowledge works and my sort of provocation is that maybe things aren't holistic always maybe things are very fragmented and fractured and what you encounter in the field is always going to be confusing for a reason not because it's confusing because people don't know how to do something right it's confusing For very specific reasons, sometimes it can be very political reasons, sometimes it can be social reasons, right? So, I I also am one of those people who grew up studying that research aims at something holistic, right? Something that is uh, rigorous. That's another word uh, which I have had to really contend with because I think recently somebody also asked me like American universities, or oh, yeah, or university, what's the difference? So, and I. I sort of reflexively said, "Oh, they are rigorous, or academic rigorous." You know? But what is academic rigor, and and what is the history of academic rigor, and why are we being asked to be rigorous in our enterprises? Something that we should be critical of, right? Who can afford to be rigorous? Who comes with the infrastructure to be rigorous, and who does not come with the infrastructure to be rigorous, right? It is not to say that we don't 
we shouldn't be rigorous, we can be. But what does our rigor look like? I mean, I'm sure people have been asking this question and I don't want to undermine those efforts. But what I'm trying to say is anthropological field, maybe that conversation needs to happen even more um, uh, explicitly. Uh, and good faith, right? Again, like such ambiguous terms, what is good faith? Like uh, to someone who is being interviewed yeah, they are putting good faith in us, perhaps, right? But who's to say the research and its afterlife is gonna lead to or uh, or speak for the good faith with what the process of the field, right? Field research, right? Um, disciplinary silo, say, I can maybe speak a little bit to that because, like, even though I am in the department of anthropology, like, um, I I have made. Um, very explicit attempts at trying to be more interdisciplinary in the way I approach my field, right? And so, um, but the field of anthropology and every other social sciences field or any other fields of research are very um, stubborn about keeping their boundaries uh, fixed, right? Because, I don't know, epistemic anxieties, who knows, right? But um, this is something that uh, I am trying to also push against and therefore, I also work with archival research or let's say historical research in anthropological work, right? And then there are, there are ways in which you can engage with, in my research at least, art historical scholarship. You can engage with people who are museum practitioners, right? There are so many ways in which you can push the boundaries of your discipline to bring into conversation perspectives from other fields as well. That's really important. On Iyako and uh, I don't mean to generalize, but I think anthropological practices here tend to be like silo. Actually, interestingly enough, sociology or anthropological lines are sometimes blurry because also institutionally, I think sociology or anthropology some some but maybe there are some ways in which they're always in conversation with each other, but there is also a lot of conflation between the two disciplines because there are very distinct ways in which sociology looks at the world and anthropology looks at the world, right? Um, so yeah, that's my sort of response to what you were saying. Um, thank you. Only prostitute on the day, very little in the town of you. I need a lot of well, then personal matters of two and then from personal matters of them from the right. Thank you. You only Anthropological research it is qualitative, quantitative methods, sort of as differences. We do the participant observation, monastery action, scholars viewpoint, field workers viewpoints, field work practitioners viewpoints. They sometimes blur each other. They don't go simultaneously with many researchers. I, I found, <laughs> for example, Scholarly Kevansa, for example, Guthi, Guthi is a practice in your community. Guthi, scholarly Kevansa, Guthi is a cultural practice of social cooperation among your, for example. And if you are Garlic Kevansa, different sects of society, different sects of Nevas perform distinct functions, and Guthi keeps the functions intact functioning. Feel your Garlic Kevansa. And if you don't practice the same thing, you can't do it. 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 And the different practices are the viewpoint are for a for a big view. So how to come to the conclusion in anthropology that is my question. Thank you for that insightful comment. Uh, it's it's an interesting example to bring because this much like who's going to point I know and that Gucci gang members are going to point to you one at a time. And I feel like that should be the main thing, right? Like that's what I'm trying to argue is that um, I'm even you. Um, so epistemic uh, authorities, runs on his scholars, they took our around. So where where does our 
epistemic authority come from, right? We interact with people, we interview them, we spend time with them, right? And they tell us how they work, how, what their everyday is like and everything. And then we extrapolate quote unquote theory from that, right? And I'm trying to say that maybe that's not how research should happen. And maybe like the, the knowledge bearers, like what are the stakes for them, right? Like, do they need to be researched? Guti as a topic I know has been researched so much, right? So what, what exactly in that field requires anthropological or social science inquiry is something we should really think about before we enter the field. And this is not to point out to Guti, I'm sorry, anything, right? And so I'm trying to point out like the, the sort of uneven terrain in which knowledge is produced, circulated and distributed, and in that authorship and ownership is perpetuated amongst scholars, right? And so what is going on is what I'm simply interested in asking. Um, he's not here, but thank you for that comment. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you so much for your very incisive talk. And I think we can continue our conversation later. But just a quick question on uh, the esteem of archaeoanthropology. You, you mentioned uh, at the very beginning that it has uh, colonial imperial roots. Uh, and Sasuts um, are, um, you mentioned that uh, we should. What would be the significance of not being siloed by certain disciplines? Like we are obvious, we obviously have to work. We have to be employed by certain departments: anthropology, art history, mm -hmm. sociology. But ultimately, we're working in this uh, this paradigm where a positivist discourse leads yeah. our thought processes. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. And if we trace the genealogy of our, all of our disciplines, all of the modern disciplines that we study in the universities, it all goes back to this post Enlightenment era. Mm -hmm. So, what would be so? And you need not answer this like I can already sense but, that I do not have an answer to what you're but, doing. Uh, so, just as a as a query, and uh, also drawing on like things that uh, the, the the work that's been happening. Uh, right now, to answer the question mm -hmm. uh, of uh, epistemic anxiety and uh, uh, the loss of epistemic diversity, mm -hmm. uh, and drawing not just on Western, with a, w, a big W, a Western, you know, methodological roots, but also relying on sources that are yeah. already present here. They may be textual sources like Bamsabadis and whatnot. They may be oral traditions. Uh, you mentioned uh, the field of indigeneity. Mm -hmm. um, so could those be considered? I don't mean to completely face the foundations of our discipline mm -hmm. but uh, while we're approaching our field work uh, a we have to be conversant in the, the language and b we require some theoretical lens when we're doing our field work mm -hmm. but when we're thinking through our questions would it be useful to also think of these sources either oral or textual that were all that have been around but have not been approached. Mm -hmm. And I know this is a very long-winded question, yeah. to, uh, but um, just curious. And we can continue this conversation yeah. later. No, thank you so much for um, that point. And, and I think more so with art history or history of art, scholars who are trying to access those kind of resources and sources know how difficult it is to, to access them, right, for various reasons. Um, and so I understand where where you are coming from in asking that question, or maybe it's not a question, it's more like a comment, right? Um, and I, because I don't look at the historical period that you you work with in your discipline, so I always, always tend to come to the post 1950s and my encounters with what knowledge could be or how knowledge is being written and produced or 
what are the sources for me as someone who's not a historian, but is thinking historically and situated in the now, right? Because like, I think there's this idea that historians look at past and anthropologists look at present, and that isn't the case, right? Historians can look, can look at present and anthropologists can look at past. It's like totally possible. Um, so I I have no response to that that is articulate and, and very you know cohesive. But in the past few months, I've been trying to track down like writings by Nepali artists themselves, how they were articulating the modern in their practice, how they were articulating the contemporary in their practice, right? And by using a form of like ethnographic sincerity, by treating the material that I encounter in my field as equally valid forms of knowledge being produced and written, is one way in which we could perhaps arrive at something that is methodologically pushing the boundaries of like, you know, where it is being governed from, right? What guidelines we're following. So that's my way of thinking is like, um, if we look around ourselves and what we are encountering in the field as what fed all those, like, you know, knowledge production, then maybe that's where one of the answers lie. Um, yeah, I don't know if that responds to what you're saying, but maybe we can talk about yes, it more. Yeah, Thank you. I mean, uh, thank you so much. Um, I particularly appreciate you challenging the idea of rigor when you talk about this. Uh, I mean, last the last two semesters, I taught at two different schools. I taught public policy students and art students research. And in doing that, it was more of it was an insightful experience for me to even I mean, challenge the assumptions I had because I think I thought I knew about the research and I had questions a lot about what it means to the research and particularly the idea of rigor, especially uh, working with my immigrant students. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I don't know. I'm going, I'm, well, I've come to the point where I shouldn't teach anymore. <laughs> That's how I've, uh, how I've felt. I wanted to actually ask you one question about uh, a statement that you made earlier about your. Um, interest in research, and you said a statement with regards to you know, your, your master's research and your final year, but I did not put into the subjects of the study, right? So you, what? you said something like, I did not want them to be the subjects of the study. Can you elaborate on the problem? Why you, and so what's your understanding of the subject, and why is that a problematic term in research? Mm. Thank you. I should have guessed you were going to ask me difficult questions. Uh, uh, thank you. Um, and yes, uh, let's challenge the idea of rigor uh, in all of our works. Uh, to your second question about the idea of a subject, right? And I think it comes from, again, I use the term cognitive dissonance, where I sometimes think that am I not the subject of study for so many people here, right? Have my communities not been the subject of study? Um, I will share an anecdote. Um, so Thakali people is one of the most uh, studied, uh, anthropologically studied community, actually. Maybe no longer, but used to be. There used to be a time. Um, so there is a lot of literature produced on them. Um, and I was interested in the grandmothers um, because um, they are not necessarily thought of as legitimate source for political knowledge and stuff like that. Um, and I was in a in one of the villages in Mustang district, and there was a researcher who was doing research on Papali people present in that moment. And uh, it so happened that in a span of two minutes, I was being interviewed for this project, right? And in that moment, I. I have never resonated with, quote unquote, the, the position of subject more, right? That I all of a sudden was now a subject being studied. And, did, and, and the way in which, the ambivalent ways in which your consent is received, how you're placed in that position, how that whole interaction goes on, and how one exits from that field has really left an impression on my mind. This is not a comment on the researcher, this is not a comment on anything, but my very embodied like response to being studied all of a sudden came into spotlight for me, right? And so 
I think the the idea that somebody is quote unquote subjected to being studied is is problematic. And Aminaji and I co-authored a paper on subjectification. So if you are interested in learning more about that, but I think there is something very inherently uh, fractured in the idea of being subjected to being studied that I think somebody should push, uh, people should be pushing uh, against. Um, and those experiences were really instrumental in making me the person I am. But I, I, at the expense of what, right, is my question. And, and I think that's where this is stemming from. And maybe I can think about what you're asking a little bit more and later we can have more conversations. Can I just add up? Mm. Because no, but I also have a question too, but it isn't the idea of even having the subject, I'm going to put this to my question stats, that mm. is not used to the research. So I'm going to put the research, the subject that I use. That, that was Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. We can stop there. Stop it. On the prosper of the answer to the era, I keep my mind. I'm just a problem. I'm born at the moment. I'm very lucky. I'm the only guest. मानसिले जब हाथ स्वतंत्र पूर्वक हल्लाने परिस्थिति बने तो डामाते टेक रहे हैं ताले इस पछाड़ी Sri Jana, Aurulya Bhanda, Badi Gatna Khali. Nava, Anmeshun Aurulya Bhanda Khali, Aviskar Aurulya Bhanda Khali. Tara tu shun shun gali, Manche ma yeshto Mano Pityan jamyo, Aakun Matre Shrestha Khandi. Awa hani, Samas Shastra Thitra, Tiyo Samad Pityan, Tara Manche Vitra ko Tiyo Mano Pityan, इस बारे में यह असली खोज करने में संदर्भ चलने रखने का मां फिर इस ब्रह्मांड में अपने आने से उनके प्रकृति में आकर यहाँ आने से यहाँ मेरा मानसिक ये स्तोम मनोविज्ञान बने हुए हैं सुविधा लाइफ के अंदर में आकर ये आज जब तीन बड़ी प्रतिस्पर्धा वही आज सबसे आस्कर हो तो असली हमें ले आओ खोज कर किन अमेरिका की ना तेज़ लगता है, रूस तेज़ लगती ना लगता है, चीन तेज़ लगती ना लगता है, प्रकृति रा मानसिक कई फेरे हैं, मूल मानसिक, मूल मानव समुदाय है वो चिहान मां, ठक कई चिहान मां हैं उसे ना, अब कितने पहाड़ और उठड़ियां होने लाए, विकास का संबंधी बंदे जाए, ये सरी जाने जा� अभी फोकस करो नहीं आई यो ब्रिहात रूप में आई यो यो चीज छात्रों का बहुत सालदाई नानी करा दो आई ये को जून खाल को चीज सोच रहा मेथडोलॉजी हो रही है ये भी यो खुश दही ना आई लाइक हाफ है ये नया खाल को प्रस्ताव से तामी नानी होने पर कृषि का मार दे चुका है सॉफ्टवेयर का मान छेड़ने मार दे � मानचिकलाई नियंत्रण करने बीड़ी से क्यों हैं? इसको बहुत जरूरी है। इसको उसको बीड़ी से यहाँ रोज़ उसको विद्वान मित्र और लम्बू पड़े हैं। आनी जस्तो आई ना और यहाँ तलाई भी भंडू पड़े हैं। आनी राखू जबरदस्त तस्वीरात पर। के कमेंट्स आ रहे हैं। थैंक यू फॉर दैट वेरी पोइटिक एंड प्रोबोक्टिव कमेंट आई मतलब और की कुरा दिमाग में आई रहती तो अपने कुरा गरी रहने में रहेगी जैसे लाइक डी डी थिंग दैट आई वुड नॉट वांट टू कन्वे थ्रू व्हाट आई हैव शेयर टुडे इज टू इसेंशियलाइज सम इमेजिन्ड लोकल और नेटिव फॉर्म ऑफ अराइविंग एट नॉलेज तो राइट सो आई 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 डू वांट टू बी केयरफुल ऑफ व्हाट आई एम सजेस्टिंग एंड 
and and that we we as researchers sometimes do tend to like romanticize and essentialize and maybe that's something that I need to also be careful at some point in what I'm writing because I feel so child. Thank you. I was thinking more in terms of Nepal social science. So your question context context to the case of Nepal. For me, Nepal my key boy or saying methodological contours saying expand so sociality. The first thing that came into my mind is student like Pusa do, time do, you know, so that they can produce value in research. They are capable to do uh, good activity, produce research, but they don't have the time and resources to do that. So if I could do things, change things, I would mm. provide them with resource, uh, money, and time. Uh, maybe utopian mm. uh, academic, academic thought of. In general, the much I'm, not, I'm very new in Nepali, Nepal na poromi sector na. So I would mean, like to very few people um, after I graduated. But uh, what I realized is uh, Nepal na so we are very much agi sasa tu ma. So I'm guilty to follow up answer tu ma. So we are very much in silos. People from you said anthropology and sociology are very much the same. Nepal na anthropology and sociology they fight. Uh, amongst each other. And so mm. we, we need to collaborate a lot, not just in social science, but beyond that. Mm. Uh, just to be this much in science and technology scholars, like I think social science, my dear, only on the here, but we are still fighting uh, amongst ourselves in that mm. uh, sense. So I was also thinking if I could expand, how would I mm. expand it beyond social sciences? Mm. How could I try to use AI to? Uh, to produce research or help me produce a good uh, ethnography or lavar to do it for I mean, who is this affair? I mean, the reflexivity of the government is to lie. Even me, the company, we are very much on the body that will question what acts where you have, the question where you have signed. So, I'm missing the body that song. From the other life of the Dukhadesan, in terms of doing research or beyond the Sotan Potsala. So, reflexivity comes in that way. When Vipti said uh, you did research with so many group of people and you didn't want to continue, I, I could relate to it a lot. You know, I realized while doing NGO research that I was giving Dukha to those people yeah. and I don't want to continue that. So I want to change that in one way or the other. I don't know how to do that, so I'm going to share some insight. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, so if we would decolonize actually uh, one way or the other, um uh, one Saudi, or similar text could be collapsed uh, product. How do we also question the Western knowledge production? How do we produce from within? So things like that are just comments you want know, Thank you. Um, I want to respond. Hey, uh, thank you so much for those comments, Oni. Yeah, um, I don't have money to give, but I would definitely give time. <laughs> um, Taro, Malasi, I mean, yes, the, the reality is infrastructure wise and funding wise, there is so little for independent research here. Right? Egg for reason. I mean, independent research, Mahapani, there are trendy topics or topics that do invite, you know, like uh, a lot of interest. One, you know? But if somebody is interested in doing research that is that does not fall under the radar of what is trendy right now, you know, those kind of topics just get suppressed, right? Um, recently, like I think some of my friends here also know, we we've been conversing with a lot of like graduate. Um, students or get your MAs or kind of thesis, but no, 
imagine the like number of theses that have been submitted by masses of students in Nepal, including myself, right? And I don't know if you, like all of us have submitted it now. Only none of us want to talk about that research. And there are a couple of reasons we don't want to talk about the research. One, we've internalized that it was not good research because we didn't get mentorship. You know? Two, because uh, research method is not good. You know? Any, so there are so many reasons. Right? So I started thinking that actually that is epistemic violence as well. I know that there are so many people, we are not even talking about outside Kathmandu, right? Uh, that's how privileged we are. But like, imagine the number of graduates coming out with who have submitted research thesis, and it's all like that's where research goes to die on us, okay? You know? All knowledge, wait, you know, and they have such interesting topics. I mean, the kind of mentorship that I'm receiving is like bleak, sorry, minimal. Kind of. So I think, yes, money, time, resources, but maybe Nicholas, my little sister, my buddy, asking questions more. Yeah, I think like the culture about the culture of asking questions really needs to be instilled, where people can ask questions to authoritative figures and feel safe enough that they can ask these questions, right? Simple as that. Uh, AI, uh, controversial topic, <laughs> no comment. <laughs> um, uh, reflexivity, yes, Molipan, you pay for Lekta Kiri, and this is something that I do want to develop. This is like a really rough draft, and thank you so much for sitting through all of this. But, uh, there are so many writings on reflexivity, you know, and yet we, we are still nowhere near uh, any kind of resolution, which is probably how it will be. There's no resolution. Like, I feel like research as a project is fundamentally like fraught. Right? That is there. You know? um, and maybe that's linked to your call for decolonizing academia. And maybe there are other people who can speak more to that. But um, but those are all like really interesting comments. And uh, all I can do is. Like, you know, in spaces like these, try to push the boundary of what presenting is a little bit, you know, like, call, that's that's all I can do, I think, at this point. You kind of, exactly what I wrote down. Um, I am a PhD in education, but like you, no loyalty. <laughs> I work here with youth activists and advocates, so a lot are master's students interested in PhDs, so research has become kind of this meta idea in my research. And like you, I would love to give them not just time, not just research, but the confidence, right, to kind of take this idea that we all have. This isn't just a phenomenon in Nepal. I'm from the US, but I'm in school in the UK, and my student peers across the world, we're scared of research, we don't have good training, we don't know what a literature review, and the way I see that has all been like bottled up into this idea that research is for the elite, it's only for certain people. So if I were to change not just social science, but hopefully all science is like, it doesn't have to be special, it doesn't have to be fancy, it can be for really anybody. Um, so I just, I, I'm so happy to be part of that conversation right now. But then my question for you that I was thinking of as well is this idea that research is done by a singular researcher. Mm -hmm. Yet I hear you comment, it sounds like so important that you have your friends who you've talked to, you co-authored with it sounds like you, other people in the future, you're interested in co-authorship. Yet why do PhDs always have to be written by the one researcher? Why why is why is that? Like none of us value that. Or a lot yeah. of us don't value that. No. Thank you. Welcome to the club of no, <laughs> no loyalties anywhere. Um well, um, I can't say why PhDs are like that. I mean, I'm sure people know why PhDs are like that, but I, I have been meaning to think about collaboration in research, and sometimes I feel like it's like an escape code for, for saying, oh yeah, but this is collaborative work, guys. Like this is, you know, all, all content has been received. This has been collaboratively, uh, like, you know, done and everything. And I, 
I do want to also like this feels like I'm just pushing all the boundaries, but um, collaborative work is really labor intensive. It burns you out. It's very exhausting. It requires a lot of um, working through frictions, right? And we have this imagined idea that collaborative work is this ideal that if we involve quote unquote local people, then you know all research subjects in your research, then it's collaborative, and it's totally not, right? And so. Are we really sincerely ready and willing to do collaborative research? Then we should talk about what that looks like. And I don't think we do that enough. Um, or maybe people are, and I'm not plugged into those conversations. If you are, please plug me into those conversations. Um, in my own research, yeah, I, I, I had these like qualms about like putting my name on, on any, any presentation or any paper because it just feels wrong, right? Um, but yeah, I, I, I have no response to that. Well, you did, and that was great. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, so something that struck me was the title of your presentation, Reading Notes from Home. And I was wondering what home is, because I don't feel at home at my home. So I was wondering whether your research site can actually be your home. Mm -hmm. How do you see the home as a research? Yeah, thank you so much for pointing that out. Um, uh, yeah, the title, I, I think there is a section that I want to develop is like, you know, like home that was always fraught with disciplining of gendered bodies, right? So that doing field work meant navigating changing skinships, right? And, and I know I'm being very obscure there, but I hope you can start teasing those words out and, and really what I am trying to talk about is, you know, these, these nuances of being home and doing field work, right? Or, or sometimes actually not doing field work because you are at home, right? Um, there is a whole field of like patchwork ethnography. I don't know if people are aware with that, but that was a conversation happening right in the middle of the pandemic when a bunch of scholars were trying to figure out, is there a way to talk about ethnography? What happens when people are doing field work from home? And what other ways can we imagine ethnography to look like, which can be not this one year long sustained staying somewhere versus it's a patchwork of encounters, right? Maybe there are three months in summer that you can come back home, right? That's when people do their research, especially international students, right? Um, you get the summer vacation, you come here, do field work, go back, study, uh, try to come here during winter, right? So we are all patching together all these encounters and we're really not doing it in a linear way at all. And home, doing field work from home makes you do things in non-linear ways. And maybe there is something very productive there to lean into that non-linear way of doing field work that home can really offer you. It's not always a site of problem and friction. I think it can also be a site where you are enabled to do things. Um, but yeah, uh, research, uh, I mean, field uh, for me is home because my PhD dissertation, which I didn't talk about, is located in, in Kathmandu, right? I, I, I have been doing field work here for the past two years. Um, and it's really funny, I think Sanjay, I said, like, when did you arrive here? And I was like, when did I leave? <laughs> I have no idea. So that tells me what my field work has been looking like, right? So um, yeah, thank you for pointing that out. And, and I hope we can talk about that later as well. Thank you.